I'm sorry, but um, I couldn't wait. <laughs> no, it's Romania Black. Couldn't wait. No, a few days ago, watched episode eight of the extended edition of Psychopaths, and Kagari's dead, and Shogo's been captured, and and Kogami got the shit beat out of him, and it was just, it was just a ride and a half, and uh, what can we do? What can we do? I, I've just been floored by where this series has gone because we still have this episode and we have two more episodes after that for the extended edition, but we're already back to where we were at the beginning of the series because I thought in episode one, that scene of Kogami and Shogo facing one another, I thought we were going to come to that series and that scene you know, like in episode 11 of this extended edition and then we'd tie it all up, but no, we've already reached that. So I'm like, well, where the hell do we go now? <laughs> and the chief, she's a robot. She might be the civil system herself. She might be the civil system or at least an embodied protector of it in some way, shape or form. Cho is dead. Kagari is dead. I, I agree we're talking in the Discord about it today because episode uh, nine just, episode eight just came out on Patreon and uh, we were talking about it and uh, Edgar was like, I really like Cho. I would have, I would have liked to see more conversations of Cho and Kagari. I'm like, I agree. Like I, I don't necessarily ship Cho and Kagari. I ship Cho more with Shogo, but I would have liked to have heard more conversation between Kagari and Cho. I think there was some interesting stuff that could have happened there, but this series is like, nah, nah, we ain't gonna let you have that. And I, like the sweet summer child that I was, was like, oh, well, the chief knows that Kagari's an enforcer. She'll let him go. Nope, not at all. So, so the question is, what, what now? Like, how is, how is the crew going to deal with Kagari being dead? How are they going to, how is it going to be explained that he's dead? Because, like, he was blown apart and we've established that the signal and stuff didn't work down there. So, is Shion going to kind of be like, mm. if they try to say that, like, a Dominator malfunctioned and went off, then is Shion going to be like, I don't know, that seems rather fishy. And how are they going to explain that death? How are they explaining Cho's death? I I don't know. I don't think the chief could be like, oh, well, Kagari went rogue. I don't think that's going to go at all. So what do we do with this? And now that we have Shogo in custody, what is the chief going to do with Shogo? How's that going to go? Uh, mm, I don't know, y'all. Mm. My thing is, if the chief is going to try to like implement like martial law with the civil system or do some crazy shit, is it going to come to the point where I was thinking about this today because we have technically six episodes left, three extended editions. Is it going to come down to them having to break Shogo out and work with him? I don't know about that, but I thought about that this morning. I was like, what if like if the Sybil system, we know it's, we know it's a flawed, weird system and we know it's really hurt and damaged like society as a whole in the most ironic of ways. What if Shogo is like necessary to, to like keep it from just going into overhaul or doing something really crazy and weird? I don't know. I don't know if I don't trust Shogo any further than I can throw his high watered, you know, pants ass, but I don't know. I'd have to think about that, but I don't know what they're going to do with him now that they have him in custody. Kagar, Kaga, Kagami's probably going to be upset because Akane didn't kill him and Akane is going to be like, shut up. <laughs> I saved your life. And we're and she's like, also Gino said not to kill him, and Gino's gonna be like, oh, you wanted to kill him? Oh, great, cool, thanks for thanks Akane for not letting that happen. Um, so I don't know, I don't know. I think the problem is before we start this episode, I think the problem is that Gino knows that if Show goes in custody, he's gonna disappear, and the chief's gonna be like, okay, bye, you don't get to see him ever again. See ya. And I think Akane and Kogami are going to be like, okay, well, what is the justice that's going to befall him? And Gino is not going to be able to tell them that. And the chief sure as hell ain't going to tell them that. So that's going to be interesting to see how do we deal with that. But yeah, Cho's gone. So, so what do we do now? I mean, I think the chaos from what Shogo has started is going to last for a while. So they're going to have to put out a lot of fires in the meantime, unless they just put out a statement being like, we got the person that created the helmets. They're now gone. We're going to round up all the helmets and get things back to normal, quote unquote. But 
I don't know. I'm so fascinated to see what's going to happen. What are we going to do for Dom Shogo and his book club? What are we going to do for Dom Shogo and his book club? How are we going to do that? So, I don't know, y'all, but I'm really excited to see how this goes down. So, we'll just have to wait and see. But, in any case, we're going to dive into episode uh, 9 of Psycho Pass, the extended edition. And we're going to do that here in 3, 2, 1... And let's uh, go. <laughs> I will tell you all right now, before we even dive into Akane and Kogami and uh, how brilliant it is and angsty. Ah! Uh, before we even dive into all that, um, and the craziness of this, um, you can definitely feel the absence of Kagari in this episode. Can you not? I mean, the absence of the Shogo book club is also there, but it just, it feels so empty without Kagari there. And it's one of those things like he's one of those side characters that you don't really think about and you don't really realize how much of an impact they have until they're not there anymore. And then suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, because Kunizuka is so quiet and she kind of like bounces off of Kagari that now that Kagari is not there and Kunizuka is so quiet, you really just sense this like emptiness. And it's just, oh, it's so sad. I'm like, no. And oh my God. Oh, so yeah. How about that? How about that? How about that twist? How about that with Shogo? Um, what I like about it is it's kind of setting up this like a dynamic where now, now we have the Sybil system. We have the Sybil system and Kasai, who is the chief, right? And we have Chief Kasai, who is kind of like um, just a cog in the, the keeper of the civil system. We'll just put them down as the keeper who also has Toma's brain in there as well. That was a twist. Nice, nice there. So we have that as a potential, like they're the ones that are supposedly the society, right? Then you have Makishima who, Makishima, who is against society. And it's like, no, not having any of it. And they just basically want things to go back to a normalcy that was before all of that, which Akane kind of talks about, which is interesting. So he's talking about that. But then you also have over here, Kogami, who is against Makishima and wants to kill him. He wants to kill Makishima, who wants to uproot... The civil system. <laughs> and then you have basically the MS, the MS, uh, oh, WPB, whatever, Public Safety Bureau, whatever it is. It's Ginoza and crew who now Kogami's gone rogue from. Gone rogue, but they all know he went away. They're like, you, you got to do what you got to do, man. Um, because the civil system was trying to kill him. Because the civil system was like, nope, you are a threat to us getting Makishima. So we want Makishima so you can't be in the picture. And so that leaves Akane. And then where do they stand with the civil system? And then that leaves Akane over here. Oh my gosh. Ah! So it's so good. It's so good. It's just, oh, it's so, it's angst, but it's so good. Damn it. I'm like, ah. Show why. And here I was going into this episode set being like, man, we only got like three extended episodes left. What are they going to do now? <laughs> well, what we're going to do now is trying to figure out what the hell to do. So we had this setup where the civil system, the civil system, they want Mikishima's brain to become part of the hive, to become part of the Borg, basically. They, and that marker is really too light, so I'm gonna need to get a better one. Maybe that looks better. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, the civil system basically wants Mikishima because he has a brain 
that is not, uh, it's basically they're like, wow, you have a brain that can outwit our system. Why don't you become part of the system and then we can use your brain to help find ways to keep that from happening, right? Because that's kind of the crazy thing is that Mikishima, he is an exception to the rule. And the civil system that is trying to be an omnipotent ruler is like, oh, you're a problem. You could defeat us. We don't like that. So they want him to become part of the system so that he can't outwit the system, right? And they try to, like, tempt him so many ways, but Makishima's answers are very interesting, and we'll get into that. So that's what the civil system is trying to do. And they have deemed that Kogami is a threat because Kogami wants to kill Makishima. And I like how self-aware Kogami is. We're going to talk about it in this episode. But I like that Kogami is self-aware. He's like, I know that me chasing Makishima is ridiculous. He's like, I know that I'm on a ghost hunt. He's like, I know it's not going to do me any good. The hunting him down isn't going to help anything. He's like, but it's gotten to the point of obsession. You know, because back several episodes ago, Masaoka was like, Kogami is obsessed with Mikishima, and he sometimes overlooks things because how obsessed he is. And I love how in this episode, Kogami's like, I know. Kogami's like, I know I'm obsessed. He's like, I know it's a problem. He's like, but I'm not going to be able to live with myself until I let it go, until I put it to rest. I can't stop. It's become an obsession and an addiction. And until I solve this, until I close this case with Mikishima, and it's over, and I get closure, I can't go on. He's like, I can't move forward. I'm stuck. And I can't get out of it. And he, we'll talk about him in Akane and all of this. And so then, oh my God, like this whole, oh, it's crazy. And so basically they determined that Kagari is MIA, which is disgusting. Oh, I hate that. It's almost worse that they just say he's missing. It's worse because we as the audience know that that the civil system killed him, but nobody else knows. But the, everybody thinks it's really fishy. Everything stuff's going awry. It's, uh it's just absolutely crazy. So we need to talk about this episode because this episode was quite interesting and there was a lot going on. Um, I don't know how long the, the discussions will be since we don't have Shogo's book club anymore. <laughs> Shogo's book club so it's like we can't talk about the books he's doing because we don't have it so it's like Shogo Shogo mentions a book though he does talk a little bit about stuff towards the end but he explains the book so it's like uh so I am amazed that I theorized back before this episode started that this whole riot and stuff would be a big problem that it would still like keep going but but since you cut off Shogo who is the supplier of the helmets that was the source of the problem since you cut him off and since these tanks have come in these like mechs came in to like get stuff like settled which I didn't know that the government here had these devices that's interesting everything's just kind of like stopped it's like, nope, we stopped the riots in a night. Glad it's over. Okay, everything can start going back to normal now, except that it can't. There's a lot more to the aftermath that they talk about, but it's crazy. Like all this collateral damage and like seeing like the blood coming from the helmet. Ah, and the helmet criminals have been wiped out. The case is closed. And they say Kagari's missing, which is just, ugh. So, okay. So... In Division 2, an enforcer escaped the confusion. So this girl, we see her, and she's going after the one, the one enforcer that supposedly escaped. Now, the question is, that enforcer that escaped, did he die? Did she kill him? Or is that just something else that's going to come up later? I'm so curious, because how's that work, right? That's so weird to me. Okay. Oh my God. And now the OP makes more sense with Akane having to choose, like, do I shoot, do I shoot Kogami who's making the gun to shoot Makishima? Uh, it's just, oh my God. What do we do? 
I love everything about the scenes with Akane and Kogami in this entire episode set. I love everything about them. I love them as a ship. I ship them so hard. They're such an angsty ship, and I'm not usually an angsty ship person, so this episode set's really difficult for Romania for Romania, because I'm like, just just tell her you love her, damn it, because you do! In that letter, it's like, damn it, you love her, and she don't knows it. Everybody knows it. I feel like Shown asking him if he would have slept with her was like just a test to be like, she's kind of teasing him being like, so you want to sleep with me? Now's your last chance before you go rogue. And he's like, you're not my type. And I'm like, yeah, you like short brunettes, don't you? It's like. If Sasayama was shorter than Kogami, then it's official that he's into short brunettes. <laughs> ah! But yeah, no, they're so perfect for one another. And what I love about it is she's such a badass. I love Akane so much. She's such a badass and she's not like, like she, oh, you could ship it and you know, they clearly like each other, but they're professionals, damn it. And it's just, it's right there. When I'm done with this series, I'm going to read so many fan fiction. Y'all don't even know. You don't even know. <laughs> Maybe you do. I'm like, no, I am like head over heels for the ship and it's over and I'm done. And if she has to kill him, I'm going to be so sad. Damn it. Son of a bitch. Mm. But yeah, she's like, can we really say that we've won? And I love his, like, his, I love how he describes detective work. He's like, we start after there are victims. So in a sense, we lose before we even start. I love this idea that they talk about being a detective and how you cannot, your work depends on a victim and that's kind of the sad thing about it is they don't get to do even do anything until there's a crime so that's the scary part of it and he's like at least we lost this in with this lost game we were able to end in a draw and i love their coats next to each other and they both are like have themselves bandaged from their wounds He's like, a safe and perfect society is just an illusion. The society we live in is still dangerous. And I love that he tells her this. He's like, yeah, we, it's kind of like what the chief was telling Ganoza back a few episodes ago, is that the whole thing is an illusion. The rest of society believes that they're safe because of the illusion that is presented in front of them. Whereas we know that the inspectors and enforcers are putting their lives on the line to keep that illusion going. And Kogami just kind of like acknowledged that with her being like, we're both smart enough to understand that, right? And, uh, and meanwhile, I like they're doing all these scans on their like bodies and stuff from the outside. People depend on things that are convenient, but also dangerous. I love how he says that as we see all the technology, like the medical technology that people are, people are using. And yeah, that's so true in our own lives. Like we depend on medicine that can be convenient, but if you overdose, it's dangerous. Or we depend on cars to transport from place to place, which are convenient, but they are also dangerous if they hit one another. And so we have all these conveniences in our lives that if used improperly or if something goes wrong with them, could also be a dangerous thing too. So I like that he acknowledges that with her. Our government has made us take risks, but the risks were dispersed and distributed so cleverly that no one's able to notice it. I love the two of them sitting back to back. Oh, it's, oh, I love it so much. Mm hmm Yep, everyone might have been looking the other way precisely because there was danger. They had to act as if there wasn't in order to keep their sanity. So it's the idea that they, they turned away, they turned away from the obvious danger to keep sane. Okay, I am gonna bring up two shows um, during this discussion that I am currently watching that during this episode I was like, mm! So, um, the first show I want to bring up right now, because it's, it has to do with this. So, if you've not seen 86, which is a show on this channel, you should go watch it. It's really good. But if you've not seen 86, 86 spoilers up here. Um, the first thing of all is the whole thing with the brains being used to power and function this omnipotent force. 
Um, I'm only on episode eight of 86, so I'm not full. I'm not fully through the season, so just keep that in mind. But it, it very much seems like the Legion in 86, where the 86, uh, the Legion, which are the enemy robots, are being powered by the brains of humans. As soon as we saw those humans in boxes, I was like, "Well, here we go." I was like, "Ah!" So yeah. Um, that reminded me instantly of 86. I was like, uh, but also this idea that we turned away from the obvious dangers to keep ourselves sane in 86, the society is kind of like the society of this country where the main character Lena lives is pretty fascist. It, they treat the 86 are a people they treat as less than human. But one of the characters in one of the previous episodes I've watched, she says, well, you know, we just, this is the only way we can function is we just have to, what she alludes to in her conversation is that they had to treat these other people as less than human to justify their actions and make themselves stay sane or they would go crazy. Now, should they go crazy because their actions were wrong? You could argue that, but it very much reminded me of 86, that conversation that this character Annette has with Lena that I was like, oh, that's exactly what this is like. So, and then the brains are exactly like the Legion taking brains and they want to assimilate you into the Borg and it's creepy and yes, so... That's 86. That's all I'm going to mention about that series. Go watch it. It's fun. But yeah, I just, and I love this close up of Kogami and his eyelashes, his beautiful, perfect eyelashes. He's like, Do you think the citizens were that clever? Is what Akane asks. And I like that he's like, Look, I'm just going to generalize, but I like to think that people are clever. And he's like, Maybe I'm rambling. And maybe I'm nervous. And I like Akane's like, you never seem nervous. But he's like, how are they going to judge Makishima? Yeah, with Kogami, he's like, he's worried that they're going to let him go. That they're going to deem him to not be a criminal. Let him go. And he's like, you know, we worked all this time. All these people died. And we did all this work to catch him. And he's not, I like that he doesn't tell Akane that she did the wrong thing immediately, right? He tries to say that later. He's like, you should have killed him. But he's also like, I knew you weren't going to do that because that's not how you are. That's not your sense of justice. Um, but I like these. like, look, we got to this point. We finally have him where we want him. If he gets let go or escapes, he's like, then it was all for nothing. Right? Then all of our work and possibly Kagari's death was for nothing. And he's like, what's going to happen next is the big issue. And so then he's asking questions like, what's the deal with Kagari? Why did the communication end? Why is nobody, why is nobody saying anything? Like, this is a big problem. He's like, something's amiss. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, we cut back to the day after all the riots and we go to this big gymnasium where there's like all of this stuff, all this medical detail being like given out. And I like how they describe it as dealing with the aftermath of a pandemic, which is very realistic and easy to understand now but I like how they explain it and I like how they talk about being like a psychological warfare like we see all of these little psychopaths hues up at the top like some of them are in like the 70s and 80s which are pretty high but some of them are in like 130 120 136 like some of them are a lot higher than others right which is a problem and we see uh, Masaoka, Ginoza, and Kunizuka there a psychohazard is a mental disease. When it spreads, this is how things turn out. I love the idea that anxiety and stress in a crowd is treated as a disease. That's such a crazy concept. I love it. I don't love it, but I think it's fascinating. Economic losses due to the crippled city functions. Yeah, like I, I do appreciate this show is saying this wasn't just... Because you know how in some series... Like, you know, Dark Knight, for example. There's all that stuff that happens during the chase with the Joker in the Dark Knight. They don't really talk about the aftermath of that. Like, there were semis that were destroyed. There were buildings that were destroyed. They were like, they don't really talk about it. They're like, oh, no, the Joker got away. But I'm like, oh, there's all this other, like, psychological and economic stuff happening to the people around the area that we don't have time to get into because it's a movie. But I like that this show has that opportunity. And Kunizuka is the one saying it. She's like, Makishima was a monstrous man. Yeah, and I like that Masioka's like, well, we can't talk in the past tense yet because we don't know if he's alive or dead. I do like this idea. Makishima is kind of in this very weird place where, as Kunizuka says, he's a monstrous man. He caused a lot of damage. 
and he is just pure chaos. He's just playing the game. He is literally Moriarty, right? But there is this aspect of him in this episode set that I'm going to be honest, I was like, damn, I don't want him to die. I was like, I don't want him to get assimilated into the Borg. No, that would be terrifying. But he is still a human. And there is a little part of him that you kind of feel like, oh, no, I don't want him to, to you know, suffer from that. So another series I want to talk about, might as well mention it now before we dive further into this episode, is um, Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. Um, I might as well mention that because I that's the first thing I thought I was like... But, uh, Jujutsu Kaisen spoilers, I, the whole idea of Toma's brain being in this other body and everything, was it not giving anybody brain coon vibes? <laughs> like, the brain coon that, like, is... And the, the hilarious thing is, is that the voice actor for Ghetto, whose body has been taken over by this literal brain monster is voiced by the same voice actor as Shogo. So the whole time Shogo, they were like, don't you want your brain to become part of the part of the assimilated civil system? I'm like, no, don't become like Ghetto. I know you have the same voice actor, but don't do it. Don't let Brain Coon get you. It's like, no. So all I can think of is like, oh my God, it's literally like Brain Coon all over again. So end of Attack on Titan, end of a, ha, end of Jujutsu Kaisen spoilers. But yeah, so it is interesting because you don't want Makishima to like have his brain lobotomized by this civil system, but then you're like, well, what do we want? And it's kind of what Akane is talking about, which we'll, we'll dive into here in a second. But yeah, they're like, it's too early to talk about the present. And I like that they have like the, the light shining in the people's eyes and their eyes are like just going wide. Like it's just showing the like just stress and unrest these people are dealing with. And then when Masioka's like, we're counting on you, Inspector, he's like, come on. He's like, quit talking to me, Enforcer. I'm like, oh, Miki, Ginoza, you big old Sundere, let your dad rib you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Come on now. <laughs> come on now. But yeah, so then we have the book that has been in the, uh, the book that she's going to get, that Toma's giving back. Okay, before we get to that, uh, I was about to say, are we on the plane yet? But no, it is where Ginoza is being told by the chief that they no longer have the ability to question what's going on. Now, the, the crazy thing is, we don't know as the audience, at what point is the chief actually Kasai? At what point are they Toma? At what point are they somebody else? We don't know. We have no freaking clue. Like, we have no clue. There's 247 brains in this system. Toma's one of them. But we don't ever know if, like, the civil system, like, lets somebody come in and out. If it's just, like, this complete cybernization where the brains can all swap out and just take in and inhabit the body of Kasai. It's crazy, right? Like, what the fudge? And so, it is suspicious that Kasai is like, well, we're going to take over this case. Don't you worry about it. I mean... I don't think Ginoza should be surprised because she told him like a few episodes ago that when the Toma case was resolved, you never saw Toma again because their brain got assimilated into the system. And so she's like, look, no, we'll take it from here. You got us our guy. That's what we wanted. Now leave. You're no longer wanted. We, we'll, we'll figure it out. And Ginoza's like, well, that's not how the justice system works. And because <laughs> I was like, this is how it works now. So bye. You handed us over the secret criminal. We'll take it from here. We'll make sure the press release looks nice and juicy. Don't you worry about it. And then I love how I love how we have the Borg cube. The Rubik's cube now looks like the Borg cube from Star Trek, where it's just like the the hive mind, the collective. Oh my God, it's crazy. But I love how the chief says in the past tense, she's like, "We'll dispose of him." No, he was disposed of. You don't even think he's alive at this point. And it's kind of like Kagari is. And it's like, it is absolutely insane. And then I love that Genosa's like, look, we don't really know if Kagari has been, you know, really missing. We don't know if he ran away. And I love just like the gaslighting that Kasai does in this entire episode set where at first she's like, oh, well, you know, the civil system's back up and running and he's just avoiding the cameras. 
And Gnose is like, that doesn't seem like Hagari at all. And then later when she's like, you know, the whole thing with bringing them back into the fold to go find Mikishima. I mean, just like total gaslighting. It is absolutely crazy. But yes, oh, should have known. The moment we saw the Gendo pose, it was over. I was like, cannot trust this bitch any further than we can throw her. Although, Mikishima can throw her pretty far. <laughs> and then I like that, okay, throughout all of this, I like that Kagami questions it. And he's like, this is bullshit. And he takes out his anger momentarily. And then Genos is like, well, this wasn't my decision. And what I like about Kagami as a character is that he gets mad. And he, he lets you know he's mad. And he lets you know why he's mad. But he doesn't get so irrational that you that he flies off the handle. He, he controls himself and calms down enough to be like, okay, fine. I've said my piece. I get why you're doing this. Uh, Kogami is just like a detective Sherlock. If Sherlock was a, a cop, that's basically what this is. If Sherlock and, oh, what's his face from Scotland Yard, like fused together and became one, that's kind of like what he would be. And I really love that about him. And I love that he just walks off and Kunizuka's like, it does feel so empty without Kagari, though. And then they have to put in this search for Kagari. And all of his stuff is lying there. Like, his switch, his, like, his dinosaur, his darts. Like, it just feels weird that he's not there. Meanwhile, we have uh, old uh, Shogo in his little green robe that wakes up. And what does it say? It says, like, his coefficient is, like, nothing, right? It's just ridiculously low and then it's good to see you haven't changed a bit so let it be known that toma borrowed a book from the shogo book club and never brought it back <laughs> and this is why you don't do that because then you get into a hive mind collective and then that's the only way you can bring the book back i like how shogo's like oh shit this is toma's it was quite difficult to find another copy are you toma and then yeah Toma's like, it's been three years. What is so unsettling throughout this entire, like, moment is just the, like, the glass shaking. Like, the whole time it felt like Jurassic Park where the glass is just, it's just like, it was doing it the whole time. It was driving me nuts. I was, like, trying to pay attention, but I was like, that is driving me insane. And it's supposed to tell you that they're in the air. They're flying. It's supposed to be, like, a a audio cue for Shogo to realize that they're in the air in transit, but it's also very unsettling. It's like a metronome gone wrong, right? Like, that was unfortunate. And I like that Shogo at first is like, did you have plastic surgery? Did you have a transition? But then they're like, no, you're a totally different person. This isn't true. And then they're like, well, Senguji did total whole body cybernization too, right? So, but the artificial body technology that is this flawless has not been made open to the public so like yeah his cyborg body is kind of ugly <laughs> this is the flawless one we haven't released to the the public yet you can't tell the difference between this body and a human can you and they're like nothing of toma you know is left except his brain oh and then when she like puts her hand behind the eyeball nope i don't like people touching eyes that's so gross to me so all that's left is toma's brain now we see, they said there were only drones on the ship, but we see nurses and stuff walking by. Were they just drones? I don't know. Or was it just like a simulation? We're not sure. And so then Shogo's like, you know, the culprit of those grotesque serial killings that seriously upset society is now the hit. I like that Shogo kind of like calls out the hypocrisy. Shogo's like, wait a minute. You mean that serial killer that I like was standing behind the whole time is now the leader of the MWPSB. There we go. MWPSB. That was it. I was like, it has some long, complicated, long, complicated acronym, acronym, MPBSB. There we go. Yep. Safety Bureau. I like that Shogo looks kind of incredulous about it. He's like, really? He's like, that's not even funny. Cause it kind of would be like, really? The society that I'm against is something that I helped build. And it's like, Maybe, maybe in a way, Shogo, you did because they've been collecting all these crazy brains. So maybe you have been helping without even realizing it. And they're like, well, that's in a precise sense. It's not the case. I'm not only Kasai. 
but I'm not always Kasai either. So yeah, they can all switch bodies. They can get into the back of the seat and switch, switch it. Our brains are unitized so they can be swapped easily. Yeah. We take turns using this body, but it serves as a bit of a break from our everyday work. Yeah, so basically they just, all these 247 brains just swap out into Kasai's body, which is insanity. So you never know who you're talking to. What? And then Shogo's like, who's this we? And he's like, I'm only a representative of the Sybil system. I was entrusted in talking to you since we're old friends. So yeah, the hive mind collective was like, oh, you know Shogo best. So we will send you to tempt him to join us. And it's like, that's so creepy. No. But yeah. So then we go back to, uh, we go back to the enforcer register at the criminal depart investigation department. He's an enforcer. So we see this guy who looks like Kagari, only with blue hair, right? And she's like, why did you run? And he's like, yeah, I wonder why myself. And so she's got this gun aimed at him. And he says she's not going to, she says she's not going to shoot him. But it's like, but then why didn't we see, like, why didn't we see his body? I'm like, ugh. So it says that he's going to fire. But then we don't see what happens next. Hmm. We just see it go straight to Kagami and Akane. So what I don't know, I don't know if that's supposed to be like a foreshadowing because we cut immediately from the two of them to Kagami and Akane. So I don't know if the scene of her in Division 2 supposedly killing her enforcer partner is supposed to signify like what Akane is going to have to do later on. Because the show is setting it up that Akane is going to have to kill Kogami. I'm hoping that Akane decides not to, but Kogami's already forgiven her if she decides to. So it's like, now it's just anybody's game, right? And I don't know if that scene with her killing her partner is supposed to signify like what Akane is supposed to do because he ran. But I don't know how it's going to end up. I don't know. I agree with Kagari um, with Kogami and Akane that the whole situation with Akare, uh, with Kogari is very weird. And that it doesn't seem likely. So they found the Dominator that was 20 kilometers away, suspiciously enough, and is registered as Kagari's, right? Yeah, it was just conveniently dropped there February 6th at 3 a.m. Hmm. No drug reaction. Hmm. So yeah, it's weird, right? And I, th I love how Masioka is instantly like, well, in all the old crime novels and crimes I've worked on, this seems like a setup. <laughs> like, I love that Masioka's just instantly like, common sense will tell us that this is a big setup. And Ginoz is like, well, we have no way of proving that that's the case. Meanwhile, we go back to Toma. Meanwhile, we're going back to Toma and Makishima being like, you're aiming for the right target that was just like you, your friend was able to discover the truth. And so she gives like the bloody phone to Shogo and Shogo's like, well, this is in poor taste. You're giving me my friend's phone. And the thing of it is, is that I'm like, Toma showing Shogo the Sybil system is meant to entice him. It's meant to tempt him to like want to become part of this omnipotent system. But I'm like, you clearly do not know Shogo at all. Or you did not know Shogo to begin with, even though you all knew each other. Because Mikishima's whole deal is that, yeah, he just wants to play the game. He doesn't want to be the one. He's, he even talks about it, how it was boring. Like, he thought the idea... I dropped my marker. He thought the idea of beating Kogami and having to kill him was like, well, this sucks. I thought we were going to keep playing the game, but I guess I have no choice but to just kill you and go on to the next person, but thanks for curing my boredom. And the way that Toma tries to phrase it, it's almost trying to tempt him being like, you know, you'll never be bored once you're in the hive mind. There's infinite possibilities of what you can do and you can control the system and all of this. But I'm like, Shogo hates the system. So even if you tempt him with the idea of controlling it and that he won't be bored, it's still like becoming part of a network that he absolutely despises and wants to dismantle. So of course he's not going to want to do that. 
the thing that's fascinating is he seems like he's trying to tempt Kogami to joining alongside him to stop the system. Instead, it's creating this like four party system where you have the civil society, you have Makishima, you have Kogami, and then you have the investigators and enforcers. And it's like they're kind of stuck with the civil system, but they're not fully for it. But they can't really work with Kogami and they're not for Makishima. So it's like this four sided war going on. And it's like, who's going to win out, you know? But creepy shit. Yeah. All these computers just going in and out in the civil system, being used to figure stuff out. Oh my gosh. And yeah, there's just like all of these brains. Like some of them say like 19.6, 27.3, like showing how the brains are supposed to be. And it's been 50 years since it started. We kept it secret and that's how we're able to create the civil system. And then, yeah, ugh. And Shogo has to see Cho get killed. And the fact that Shogo can see Cho's, like, eyeballs and, like, blood and guts there in front of him. Poor taste, Toma. Poor taste. By having 200 of the 247 connected at any given time. Then we can be able to see, we can continuously monitor and judge the psychopaths of everyone in the country. Crazy talk. Yeah, and poor Shogo. He has to see that. Mm. And then he knows that someone else was shot and that the robot comes to grip, pick it up. Oh, creepy. And you can just tell Shogo's like, well, that was disgusting and in poor taste. Okay. It's like, what a joke. Management of a fair society by machines, a society that doesn't depend on human egos. We accepted the civil system because that's how it was presented. I love his smirk there where he's like, so we accepted this system because supposedly machines were running it, but it's really just been a hive of human brains. Imagine that. So I love that. I love the show goes like, funny that. We thought that it was going to be a little fair and perfect little system, but it's just as bad as if it was run by just 240 people on their own. Ha, huh, how about that? But I love that Thomas like, no, we are an existence that transcends mankind. And Shogo's like, oh, really? You're better than humanity. Okay. That's kind of the interesting thing is that Shogo's whole philosophy has not been necessarily to stop humanity or destroy it. That kind of seems now like the civil system. His whole thing is that he almost in this weird way wants to restore humanity to being able to be itself. The problem is the means that he goes about it are horrific and kill people. So that's the problem, right? Whereas the civil system, they're talking about like transcending mankind and becoming beyond it. And Shogo's like, I don't know if that transcendence is, you know, all it's cracked up to be. Maybe not. Maybe we shouldn't do that. I don't know about that. But it's like without being lost to emotion, you should be able to oversee human actions from an outsider's viewpoint. And just keeps shaking. Such talent is desired. We need people who can be emotionless, whose crime coefficient can't be determined by the psychopaths. So we need people like you to have a new ideology and sense of values to add to the coefficient. We need something to beef up the AI. And your brain, Shogo, would be just the one to do it. But the thing about it is, they frame it as Shogo becoming like this omnipotent ruler, but they themselves have established that there is no one ruler. It's a collective of almost 300 minds. So I, it is insanity. Yep. You disappeared without being executed because I was added as a member of the civil system. Yep. And then I love the idea, like, it's like, I was puzzled at first, but I could get, understand the splendor very quickly. Like, it's just become, it's like, like, the system's fun, become part of the system. I feel like I'm a prophet because I can rule under this system. Don't you want to understand that, Shogo? Come play with us. <laughs> it's like, ah, like, I don't want Shogo to become part of the system. That sounds terrifying. Nope. We should be proud of the nobility of the mission given to us as our fate. And Shogo's like, mm, no, I don't want to become a member of this system. I think I'm happy with my body right now. I don't think I just want to be a brain. But of course they want Shogo because he's this like amazing mind. 
that would be an amazing addition to the system and the algorithm. Mm -hmm. I do think it's interesting that they say that the system works better or maybe the brains are accepted better or there's more of like a um, compatibility rate if they go freely. Like if the brains willingly join the system, then there's a better chance of them being accepted and being able to be used. So of course that's how they want to frame it. But here's the thing. After Shogo says no and decides to leave, they still want him. And they're like, oh, bring him back to us alive again. It's like, are they going to be as generous the next time around? Or are they going to say, screw free will. We're going to make your brain part of the system. And if it doesn't work, forget about it. But if it does, then you're one of us. The fudge. And they're like, we, this would not impede upon your independence as an individual. And I like how they say some of Toma is still in the system, which is creepy, but not entirely true. They're like, oh yeah, I'm, I have a sense of myself as Toma. And Shogo's like, sure, of course you do. But the moment we cut to the still of him, like touching the book, I was like, nah, he is not going to become part of the system. Because he just told Cho in the last episode set that he likes, he doesn't like ebooks. He likes physical books. He likes the physical sim stimulation. If you're a brain in the matrix, that ain't going to be possible. So I love that he just touches the book like, no, I want to stay in this physical world as long as I can. So thanks, but no thanks. I honestly got to love Shogo's character a lot more in this episode because of him just being like, no. He's like, it sounds like a member of Gulliver's Travels, part three. I love, I love that even in this moment, even when he is like facing the possibility of death, Shogo will not pass up the opportunity to be a snobby, pretentious bitch. <laughs> Where he's just like, what, you didn't read Gulliver's Travels, part three? You just read part one like a plebeian? Really? Because <laughs> if you'd read part three, you would have known all about this lobotomy part. Which, I've not read Gulliver's Travels Part 3, so I had no clue that they were cutting people's brains in half and sewing them together. No idea. I was like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah. He's like, talking about flying to the island of Laputa and everything that goes on with it. It was a way for them to solve the problems by just having their brains sewn together. It was to produce that moderation as well as regularity of thinking for the self-conceited lot who think, they come into the world only to watch and govern its motion. And like Swift writes that it's the most desirable approach. And I love that she's reaching for the gun as he says this. She's like, you're a genius at sarcasm. And he's like, I'm not, but Swift is. I'm like, what a line! What a line! And of course, I was like, did they think the Dominator was going to work on him because you can't test his coefficient? I guess because... The Dominator, if Kasai has it, it's modified where it will it will override the system and work. But Shogo's like, bitch, I ain't taking no chance. I love that he chucks the book at her head. Amazing. And then he takes a page out of Akane's book and just slings the machine at her. I'm like, oh. Now here's the thing. Do I think that Shogo and Akane are very similar? Surprisingly, yeah, I do. In the weirdest of ways. Except Akane is like lawful good and Shogo is like chaotic neutral and we have I guess is it is it lawful evil that Kogami has no I don't think so I think it's like I don't know because I don't want to think of Kogami as evil right I don't know but he's talking about killing Shogo so I don't know right but Akane is lawful good for sure absolutely I don't know what to make of Kogami till the end though and then I love that he just like breaks her legs to sling her up against the building, right? What the fudge? Now, was it the was it uh, Kasai's body that they took off of the plane at the end? Hmm. Because he figures out that they're in the air right now. And he's like, the joy of omnipotence and pleasure of governing the world. I'm not into being an umpire referee. I just want to play the game. Oh my God, I love this whole sequence. And he just like beats the shit out of her. Are you afraid of dying even after gaining the perception of God? I'm telling you, Kogami, Kogami and Akane are my jam. But Shogo, Shogo kind of won me over a little bit in this episode. Because what a way, what a way. And then he like is looking at the plane, like he throws the book out. But how is he going to survive going down? He has to jump out at some point, right? I don't know. 
The jump scare of Makishima being you know, on the couch next to Kogami, there was no logical reason why I should think that, that was real. But for a second, I was like, oh, shit, what? Maybe, maybe he just snuck down in there and got in there. I don't know. But also, Kogami, I would not have put the coffee pot on the, on the coffee table. I would have kept that on your workbench, but whatever. Whatever. But clearly, he's being kept up at night and thinking after this, he gets the unknown call message. Where they say that I found the true form of the civil system. So Makishima's still alive somewhere. It's not worth putting your life on the line to protect. Well, that was awfully nice of him, wasn't it? To tell them that. To go ahead and tell them that they might as well stop doing it. I thought that was nice of Shogo. Like, how nice of him to help Kogami out. <laughs> but instead, Kogami kind of obsesses over it. And then Gino is like, no. The plane with him in it seems to have crashed. I do find it interesting where Kogami has like the coffee cups fall to the floor and Kogami kind of has this like inner demon inside of him that is in the form of Makishima where he's like Makishima escaped and he's like so what do we do? Is this a bad joke? And then I love that Makishima kind of you know he's like everybody's been acting really bizarre. He's like what do I do? He's like, you guys should have chosen the lethal option. Mm. And then they're like, on whom? Are you going to make me spell it out? You know who I'm talking about. And I love that Shogo's looking there. He's like, that was Sunamori's decision. Like, it shows her belief as an inspector. Yeah, she has this strong will. And they're like, oh, well, you're such a good little doggy loyal to your owner. I'm like, ah, but I'm like, Kogami does like, or Kogami does like her, but and he respects her and her decisions, but he knows that he's frustrated because that's not the decision that he would have made. Mm. Oof. And I love that Makishima is like his inner devil voice. And he's like, but do you think you can keep up with me? If you're on a leash. The moment that Kogami starts thinking this, he's like, if I'm stuck here, I'm not going to get to him. What I'm glad about is at that moment, I was like, well, Kogami's going to run. Kogami's going to try to escape to go off on his own to find Kishima because he knows that Ginoza and them, he knows that the upper brass are acting fishy. They're not going to stop until they catch Makishima alive again, which is true. And he's like, and he's going to keep escaping and until he's dead we're not going to this isn't going to stop for Kogami he's not going to be able to rest easy or rest in peace or die you know at the end of all this until he knows that Shogo's gone so what do we do about that what do we do about that and the problem is I could I see Akane killing Kogami yeah I could sadly I don't want her to but if Shogo dies, will Kogami die with him and it'll be like this Shakespearean tragedy? That's a very big possibility. But then we got two more seasons, damn it. I I don't want Kogami to die, but then I don't know how he's going to move on from Shogo. I'm Y'all. I don't know. But I, the moment he thought about running here, I was like, is he actually going to run? And the thing that I'm happy about is that he didn't just go off without leaving Akane a note explaining himself. That note at the end was beautiful, and we'll talk about it. But I love that he didn't do that. I love that he snuck around. He stuck around, and they tried to do things somewhat logistically, and then it just fell apart, and he was like, no, I gotta go. But at this moment, I was like, oh, he's gonna run, right? And I, you can just feel that Kogami is so frustrated because he wants to do the right thing like Akane, but he's not like her. And I'm honestly, I'm glad that Akane is, I'm glad Akane is not following in the same footsteps as Kogami. And I'm glad that Kogami is not trying to get her to follow in the same footsteps as him with Mikishima. I'm glad she's not obsessed with Mikishima like he is. I was worried about that when her friend died, if she was going to follow the same footsteps, but she's not. So then they go down to the scene of the crash, right? They go down to the scene of the crash and they investigate it and then they see somebody being carried off and okay you can see the the shoes so I'm guessing that's the body of Kasai you just can't see it because the, the the sheet's over and then that's when the chief shows up but yeah it is very suspicious 
that after telling them they had nothing to do with the case, they had no one to be on the on the job, that now they're back on it to go find him. Which this wishy-washy mentality that Kasai is giving, now all of the moments where Kasai has seemed like in one mood one day and one mood the next day, it all makes sense now because the brains have been switching. Like they've been different brains switching with Kasai this whole time. So of course they are different. That's so bizarre to me. And it shows how the system is not, you know, as perfect and, you know, what am I trying to say? It's not as perfect and it's not as um, unregulated. What am I trying to say? It's not as perfect and unbiased as it seems to be because there's different brains inhabiting at different times, right? It's not just this one I identity, right? Oh my God. But the gaslighting where Kasai is like, well, you're going to be put to blame if you don't find him this time. So you better make the right decision. And I don't want Kogami on the case because Shogo is, Shogo's safety is your top priority. And we know that Kogami wants to kill him. Oh my God. And honestly, Kogami, Kogami handles it really well when he says that he's not allowed on the case. I think because Kogami knows that he's going to leave and he's going to run away. So he's not surprised by what they tell him. And those are the chief's orders. And Kogami thinks it's strange that she puts him off the case. And then he's, he basically figures it all out. Like Kogami's freaking Sherlock. And that's the other thing. I'm like, if Kogami is left to live all three seasons, is he going to be like a Sherlock that figures this whole thing out? Or is he going to die with Shogo? I don't know. I don't want Kogami to die. But this episode's giving me all the death flags and I hate it. I hate it. Ah! Mm. two more episodes of season one left how dare i see that will she reduce the manpower even more i mean he's figured it out what what they're doing and that they're basically just protecting makishima till till the civil system gets their hands on him right and then yeah oh poor kagari we don't even know where he is but kogami thinks that he's dead oh it sucks and so they're like, well, why did they use an airport to transport him instead of a paddy wagon? Like, why is this like this way? Why are there only drones with him? And all this weird stuff is adding up. Something's wrong. And I love that Masioka's like, look, nobody likes this. Nobody's accepting it. But we can only do what we got to do. Nobody accepts it, Co. It's top secret and the inspectors wouldn't know the answers either. And then I like that Akane goes after him. And he's like... This is exactly like the report I saw Dino give to the top brass. I love that Akane is like, did you sneak those reports again like you weren't supposed to, Kogami? <laughs> but then she doesn't stop him from telling him what he found out, which is great. And he's like, yeah, he erased the part about the Dominator. And Akane is like, mm. the top brass are trying to erase the fact that there are people who can't be judged by the Sybil system. My fear is that they're going to figure out that Akane can't be judged by the civil system. That's my fear. Because I don't think that Akane can. I think her coefficient staying the same as like Makishima, that she's one of the one in two million. So I fear that if they find out that she, you know, doesn't have a coefficient to change, then she's going to have to go on the run too because they're going to try to like take her in and what's going to happen there. So I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's a way that Kogami and Shogo can keep alive. Maybe they both have to keep her safe or help her keep safe. I don't know. If it keeps them all alive, I'm fine with that. Can this be an OT3? I don't know. Maybe. I'm not opposed. And then I like that Akane tells him, like, during the riots, I realized that enforcing justice and maintaining order are both important. We have to do our part to keep order in the system. And I think that's why Kogami is like, well, what do you think we can do when those who are, are outside the law to settle things? She's like, well, we can make this an exceptional case and go back to the old system where we prosecute him, open court and let him defend himself and have a trial and then sentence him. And I like that Kogami is like, well, that'll take a long time. And it's like, yes, that does take a long time. It is a daunting process. But I like that Akane, she kind of has like Masaoka's old mind of justice in mind where she's like, no, but that's the right thing to do. That would be what's fair. And that's what we should do. Who knows, who knows how long it would take to prepare? She's like, well, there's no other way. And he's like, well, we could kill him. And then I like that she's like, look, you said you were going to be a detective, not a dog. 
So I want you to stay a dog. I want you to stay a detective. She's like, I don't want you to become a killer. I love that Connie's like, she's thinking about him. And she's like, look, you said you were a detective and that inspired me and that kept me going. She's like, I don't want you to betray that and become a hunting dog. She's like, will you be a detective for me? And he told, he tells her, yeah, but then he says later that he betrayed her. But I love that she wants to think the best of Kogami and she wants him to be the best version of himself. And I love that she is this pillar of justice. Even when she was tempted by the devil himself, she said no. And she kept this maintained sense of justice. And I love that Kogami's like, I can't be as good as you. It's just like, oh, but what if you could? <laughs> but what if you could? Uh, uh, I want to read fan fiction of them so bad, but I can't yet. Sad days. So I like this whole conversation with Masaoka telling him, uh, telling Ginoza about the idea of the dog, the master, and the ball. So we have the idea that the civil system is making the Kishima this ball that is supposed to be played with by the MWPSB. And I like that Masioka says, well, okay, if there's a civil system, then Ginoza, you become the ball and let that be part of this. And I think Ginoza's like, what do you mean by that? And I like that Masioka's saying, look, if you're just, you know, don't try to take this into your own hands. Don't try to get involved. Just sit back, let things play out, and you won't be hurt. The way that Masioka says that is such a fatherly thing to do. He doesn't want Ginoza to get hurt. He doesn't want Ginoza to get killed. He doesn't want him to get caught too caught up in the system and not be able to get out. He's trying to spare Ginoza from any more pain. And Ginoza's like, well, who are you to judge and make this decision? And it's like, ugh. And when he says no Bachika, I'm like, uh, someone said um, a few episodes back that I should have realized that uh, Masioka and Ginoza were father and son because he said no Bachika. And I remember that, but I thought maybe it was like they just knew each other on very, very personal terms. Didn't think it was family, but it makes sense. And he's like, what is it? And then he says, protect yourself. Oh, Masioka doesn't want his son to die. It's like Akane doesn't want Kogami to die. Masioka doesn't want Ginoza to die. I don't want any more of them to die. I'm like, leave them alone, please. He's like, you'll be punished if you disobey. Just be a third party and then you won't have to do, you won't have to suffer. He's like, this case is too much for you to handle. Uh, he's like, rather than acting carelessly and end up being forced to resign, it's better to act useless. He's like, he's like, don't try to play a hero. Because this is too much. You're in too deep. Don't play a hero. You'll end up like me and resign and be an enforcer. Just sit back and just let the cards fall. And I think Masioka knew, knows that Kogami's going to run. He knows it's going to happen. And he knows they're not going to be able to stop him. So he's like, he's like, this stuff's all going to work out. So just, just let it happen. But Ginoza's too much like his dad. He's too much like his father. That's some terrible advice. Uh... I hate it. And he's like, well, I thought you'd be smarter than I am about that kind of stuff. And he's like, must be the so-called wisdom of age. Mm. Uh, we can't afford to not have Kogami when we go after Makishima. But he's already, there's no other hunting dog with a keen nose as Kogami's. And so they try this whole ploy, which is interesting. So they have this one lady. Now, she's with this new guy. I don't know. I don't quite trust her. I don't trust the lady because we don't know what happened with her partner and all this. I don't trust her. She might have led the chief to find them to begin with. We don't know. The point is that Kasai finds them. The crazy thing is that this all works out where Akane is the one that outsmarts the system. And I'm sorry, but I don't think it takes, I don't think it takes a genius to realize that this was some messed up shit because she, when the moment that the dominator that's supposed to paralyze, that is supposed to paralyze Kogami, because it says his crime coefficient is 265.8, says it's supposed to be paralyzed. And you can tell Kogami's just like, well, if he's going to do it. But then when she 
touches the dominator it overrides it into this eliminator mode which everybody's just like oh how'd this happen i'm like doesn't that seem fishy <laughs> doesn't it and the crazy thing is that it goes to eliminate him and kogami's like well huh and the moment that she's like show me how to take charge as a leader akane saved all their asses right now she saved Ginoza from having to not do the thing and end up being, you know, demoted. She saved Kogami from literally dying. Akane, savior of this whole episode. Seriously. And I would be, I would be suspicious as hell about that woman after she just tried to do a devil temptation with you. What? Which we don't see how Ginoza reacts after this, so maybe we'll cut back to that. Show me your device is decisiveness unhindered by emotion. Well, then it says the crime coefficient is 329. That's what says it's gone up to because Kogami, but is that true or not? And Kogami is just, he accepts his fate. Kogami accepts he's going to die. And Gnoza's, Gnoza can't do it. And that's when Akane, she takes the shot and she's like, nope, paralyzed. Yep. Now it hit his shoulder, but then later it says he hit its leg. So I don't know what that, what the deal with that is. But then, yeah. And Akane looking over at the chief and saying for a target who's crime proficient, the paralyzer must be used. That dominator is broken. She doesn't even look at them. Akane, you should send it to maintenance immediately. And then, yeah, so that's when the chief looks over and is like, huh. So I'm worried for Akane. I'm worried the chief is going to be like, this little witch, she spoiled my plans. Because I was going to get him killed, but now they're witnesses. I can't just outright kill them because then I have to kill all of them and then hide it. And I can't do that. Oh, oh, best scene in the whole episode. I love that scene. Akane's just like, your thing's defective. Like she finds a very rational conclusion to it. Akane is terrifying and I love her. And then of course, Kogami wakes up and he sees her there. And he's like, damn it, she saved me. I love that she's just sleeping with her mouth open. They're so perfect for each other and why can't we have nice things? Why can't they be a ship? Uh, just why? No, they're so perfect together in this moment. Why? Why? And, she, and then, yeah, she all comes in, she's going to break it up and he's like, no, 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 don't. And then she, I love that Shion's like, she's gotten used to using the Dominator. She's like, you know, when an inexperienced newbie be rapidly becomes tough, it's reassuring, but it's also sad. It's complicated, huh? I love that she says that because it's like on the one hand, she's like, it's reassuring that they're tough enough to save themselves, but it's also sad that they have to be tough now, that they've seen so much death and they're okay and kind of like desensitized to it. And Kogami telling Shion, being like, she's going to get tougher and tougher. And he says it like he's proud. Like he smiles when he says it. Saying she'll get tougher and tougher. Oh, so he takes the helmet. I like that the way that Shion phrases it, she almost phrases it like, oh, well, the way that she says it is kind of like where if they were recording what she was saying, they couldn't use that against her. She was like, no, please. Don't take the helmet. It'll be active in six days, so you shouldn't take it out of the building. Don't take it. <laughs> and, like, unlocks it so he can take it. I'm like, ah, Damn it. She knows that he's running away. And then I love that she says, should I have slept with you at least once? And I love his response. He's like, who knows? I don't think we're each other's type. <laughs> Kogami is not into tall blondes and Shion's not into men. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And then I love that she knows he's leaving. I know that Masioka knows that he's leaving. They like pour each other a drink. And I love that Masioka's like, you didn't tell the missy. And he's like, I'm leaving her a note. And I like how Masioka says, is it the evil you can't tolerate or is it, Ma or is it Mikishima himself? Are you targeting him because of all he's done or just because of who he is? And Kogami's like, it's neither, Pops. I love that he called Masioka Pops. 
Like, Genosa doesn't call him his father, but Kobe's like his son he never had. And that makes, to me, I know a lot of people ship Genosa and Kogami, but to me, him calling him Pops, that to me is like a brother thing. Like, Genosa and Kogami are like brothers. And he's like the son Masioka didn't have. Ugh. If I give up now, I'll come to resent myself for letting him get away. Yeah, it's just he can't do it. It's the crime he has to solve. It's the case he has to close. And he won't be satisfied until he does it. I can't allow that to happen. I like that Masioka smiles and he's like, well, that answer is you. It's very co. Because I think Masioka understands. He's like, I get it. I get why you got you can't let this case go. Oh. And then he gives him the key. I love that it's like this, like, I love it says genius on the key cover. He's like, when I was in the Metropolitan Police Department, it's a safe house. And it's a safe house. What I was trying to say in the reaction is it's the house that he was with, with Genoza back during the flashback. Because you see the stuff under the, under the cover and everything. Oh. And then he's like, aren't you going to leave? You're not going to leave without saying a word to Missy? He's like, I can't face her now. He's like, we well, should help her come to terms. And he's like, yeah. I like that Masioka gives him the idea to leave the letter. He's like, don't leave without saying goodbye to her. Like, you at least owe her that respect. She did save your life. I'm like, ah. And then I love the idea of him leaving her the note and leaves her the cuff. And then it starts to the ED talking about loving someone. I'm like, stop making this romantic and angsty as hell. And he like leaves and goes away and he goes to the safe house at the dock. Oh, he says, I'm sorry I couldn't keep my promise. And I love that you see him. He's like, I wanted to go into a line of work where I could protect people. And that's why I became a detective. But Makishima changed everything. And he's going to continue to kill people. And the law can't judge him. And as long as I'm a detective, I can't touch him. Real quick, before I finish this letter, I want to bring up another series that I'm watching, which is called Monster. And it's just hitting me. I'm like, uh, in Monster, this is like early episode, like episode one, episode two spoilers. But I'm going to put it up here because I'm not finished with the series. But I'm going to put Monster Spoiler up here anyway. But in that series, there's the main character named Tinma, And he's a doctor. And he saves the life of this man who goes on to become a serial killer. And this is, again, the very basic version of the story so far. I'm not finished with it. But he becomes kind of obsessed with the serial killer. And he keeps, he like, is like, I became a doctor to save lives. But now I've saved the life of this man that's killing people. And I can't do my job anymore because it's driving me crazy knowing that he's still out there killing people. And I need to stop him. So Tinma's obsession with the main, with the main antagonist is kind of like... It's very much like Kogami's obsession with Shogo. Like that they just can't go on. The thing about it is, and that's in the monster spoilers. The thing about that's so crazy is that Kogami's like, as long as I'm a detective, I can't touch him. So it's kind of this weird scenario where Kogami is like, I wanted to save people and protect them. So I became a detective. But... You have Mikishima, and Mikishima is harming people and killing them, but now Kogami's like, I can't be a detective and do anything about stopping him because this, the system that I joined to save people is no longer able to let me save people. So he's like, for me, I can't keep doing my job as a detective like you want me to. He's like, the law here can't protect people. My only option is to step outside the law and become this vigilante. He's like, Akane Sunamori, there's no doubt that your way of living is correct. I love that he tells her she's correct. That is the one thing I was afraid that he was going to be like. Because, you know, sometimes in series people are like, and I'm thinking of like the fandom with Attack on Titan, for example. And no spoilers for Attack on Titan. But there's a lot of people who are like, oh, well, these characters that want this idealistic path, they are wrong because there's no way that'll ever happen. And they are being idealistic and folly and blah, blah, blah. But I like that Kogami here is like, no, you're right. 
this is what we should do. He should have a trial. And your sense of justice is correct, but I can't do it. He's like, don't lose sight of that just because I betrayed you. I love that he tells her that. I love that he says, look, just because I couldn't live by that code of justice doesn't mean that code of justice is wrong. It just means I can't live by it. But you should keep doing what you think is right. Ah! Ah! I want to be a snoopy. Ah! Yes. I selfishly chose a different path solely to get my own way. Oh my god! I'm sorry! No! Attack on Titan spoilers! Never mind! I'm lying! I'm, this is the fourth show I've connected to this. Oh my god. But yes, that's literally like Aaron being like, look, I selfishly chose this path different from you all and the path of peace because I had to get my own way. I couldn't stop it. And I'm not saying you're wrong, but this is what I had to do. <sighs> End of Attack on Titan spoilers. Yep. I just, uh, it's so heartbreaking. And he's like, I'm aware that this is a mistake. And he's making the gun. Yeah. He's getting the safe and getting the stuff to make the gun. He's like, I can only come to terms with my old self by taking the wrong path. I love that. I love that line where he's like, I know how I am in the past. My old self, I can't let that self die unless I take this wrong path and kill Makishima. He's like, that's all I have to do. He's like, I can't, otherwise I can't have closure. And he's like, I won't say forgive me. Because he's like, I know that you may. He's like, the next time we meet, you'll have to be in a position to judge me. And when that time comes, he's like, fulfill your duty with no mercy and don't turn your back on your beliefs. So he's basically saying that it's like a suicide mission. He's like, I know that the next time we meet, if you are honoring your sense of justice, you'll probably have to kill me. But, but I'm sorry. That's, and, and part of me inside is like, well, she spared Mikishima so she could spare you, Kogami. But then the other part of me is like, no, they were ordered to keep Mikishima alive. She was just following her orders. And if she's being ordered to kill Kogami, which I'm sure she's going to be, then she has to follow orders. And plus, if they take Kogami in, if they arrest him, you know what they're going to do? They're going to put him in one of those jail cells and he's probably going to stay there the rest of his life or die. So it's like, it's, damn it, it's the ship thing where the person's like, oh my God, it's such a ship thing. There, There's so many anime ships where they're like, if somebody has to kill me, I want it to be you. Ah! No, that's it. That's it. Oh my God. Yeah, it's like case study of Vanitas. It's like Moriarty. It's like all these ships where they're like, if somebody, it's like Modao Zushi where he's like, if somebody's going to kill me, I want it to be the person I love. God damn it. No. No! Although it was only for a short time, I was fortunate I was able to work under you. Thank you. Uh, and then her crying and being like, you baka. Uh, oh, I hate it. It's the saddest thing. The saddest thing in the world. Why? Why can't we have nice things? I just. So there's a lot of ways this can go down. The question is going to be whether we get to the end of Shogo's story at the end of this season because we have two more episodes that are extended we technically have four episodes left so are we going to get to finding Shogo at the end of this are we going to see if Akane and Kogami find Shogo and what happens and who lives and who dies this season I would assume so but I don't know are they going to leave us on a cliffhanger in the final episode where we don't get to see that I, I don't know at this point, they obviously are trying to find Shogo. They're trying to figure out if Kagari's dead or not. Civil system's being weird as F. Um, and Kogami's on his own. So, I, what do we do? What's going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm excited to see what's going to happen next, though. I can tell you that. So, in the meantime, um, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And, yeah, I... I will be back very soon with more of Psychopaths. Excited to hear your comments down below. Bye.